<clears throat> All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, sorry about Monday. It was really absolutely out of my control. I know uh, a fourth of my city lost power. I'm sure I wasn't the only one without power, so it probably worked out for the better. Um, but uh, the fun thing was I didn't even get everything back until like yesterday evening. Uh, but that doesn't matter. <clears throat> what matters is that we move forward and we get as much done as we can, even though we have now missed three days. Ooh, that is rough. So because of that fact, I've been really sitting down and thinking about the material for this course, um, what you absolutely need going forward, what you could arguably not see in this course and still be okay in the future. So what I've decided is that once we finish chapter seven, which we have a little bit of seven, six left, and then a little bit of three, uh, oh, sorry, seven, seven, not three, seven. <laughs> Um, we only cover about a third of the material in 7.7, .7, which is why the homework is so short. So after we finish those two sections, we're going to go straight to chapter 11. So 11 is on something called sequences and series, and it is vital that you learn the notation that's in that chapter. It's vital that you start kind of seeing the formulas for these things. Because if you're going on to Calc 2, you're going to deal with this stuff over and over and over and over and over. Chapter 10 is on uh, the ellipse, the circle, the parabola, and the hyperbola. And two of those things you've already studied previously, parabolas and circles. But you approach them in a geometric manner instead of an algebraic manner, which actually does change how things work a little bit. But at least you have seen some of these things before. And honestly, it's just a chapter of formulas. Hey, if, if it's in this form, then it's a circle. If it's in this form, it's a parabola. If it's in this form, it's a hyperbola or vice versa. Here's the information, put it in the form. Your pre-calc two students at this point, you should be capable of learning a formula, no matter what it is, no matter what strange topic, if it's just a formula and inserting numbers into it, you should be capable of doing that, uh, no matter what the topic is. So I think, that chapter 10 will be good just to kind of do a quick summary with our last one, maybe even two days left. I don't know how, long, how much we're going to have, but either way, this rant is just wasting time. Just to say that after chapter seven, we're going to go to chapter 11. So I'm going to open those homeworks up today in my math lab, um, probably around 11 a.m. after my second class. And then we'll come back to chapter 10. So that's going to drastically change how the next test is going to go. So I need to uh, uh, gather more thoughts and ideas for myself before I talk about that. So I should have more information on the third test next class. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay. <clears throat> so we left off talking about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing vectors. Let me do this. So 7.6 continued. I'm just gonna do some notes on this screen for a minute. <clears throat> um, So the last example we did was example 2A and B, where we were given the starting and the terminating positions of our vectors or the terminal positions. And we found the A and the B, and we put them in that standard form that uh, like 3i minus 12j or 12i plus j. We also gave you the other form uh, was, that was inside of those uh, what look like less than and greater than signs. So something like 3i minus 12j would be the same thing as three comma negative 12 inside of those again what looks like less than and greater than signs instead of parentheses so that's an, another notation for vectors now again that i and the j they should be bolded or they should have the little arrows above them one or the other it doesn't matter which <clears throat> so there's arguably three different notations for this so where we left off what with was that we can add subtract two vectors, u and v. As well as multiply them by scalars, quite simply.
So in other words, if we're given the wrong one, <laughs> there we go. We can find, so if we're given the vectors u and v, we can find say three u or we can find u plus v or we can find six times u minus five times v where we handle the scalars first Remember, a scalar is just a constant. It's a 3, it's a 5, it's a negative 17. So when I say handle the scalars first, what I'm talking about is the 3, the 6, and the negative 5 in those examples. So you would be distributing a 3 to the components of the vector u, or we're distributing 6 to the components of the vector u, and distributing a negative 5 to the components of the vector v. There is really no complicated math anywhere in this. This is just normal arithmetic and basic algebra. So let's try it out. With example three. <clears throat> Given, let's have u be five i plus three j. <clears throat> excuse me, and the vector v be 9i minus 2j. I always like to curl my i's and j's backwards. If you haven't been able to tell that yet, like that. Let's find for a, 3 times the vector u. <clears throat> For B, let's do negative two times the vector V. For C, let's add them, U plus V. And then for D, four times U minus three times V. All right. So three times the vector u. So I don't even care what the vector v is for this one. <laughs> for, for problem a, I'm not even looking at this at all. So three times u. That says we have a three, and then instead of writing the vector u, let's write what it is with the components, five i plus three j. But we're gonna have to distribute. Now, me personally, if I write the letter i and j, I know these are vectors. I'm technically supposed to have these bolded, but it just gets really tedious to have to do that or put the arrows over them. So you're, you will not always see me write arrows over the i's or j's or always bold them. And on a handwritten test, I would accept the same thing. Voice is going. So again, handwritten test, I would not mind if these weren't bolded, if they didn't have the little vectors over them. But I'll try and be consistent for the most part. All right, so distribute the three. Three times five is 15, so that's 15i. And then plus the three times the three is a nine, so that's 9j. And that's it. That's all there is to it, easy peasy. For problem b, that's negative two times v. Well. We have a negative two times the vector v. So this time we don't care what u is, just the v. So that's negative two times nine i minus two j. <clears throat> Once again, distribute the negative two times the nine is negative 18 i. Again, I'll put the vectors over them. Then the negative two times the negative two makes a positive four. J. 
Again, some people don't do the dots, they just do the vectors. <laughs> Again, as long as I see an I and a J, it's okay. But please be careful in my math lab. If they ask you to bold it, please bold it. They're not gonna ask you to put errors over it. I can tell you that much, but they may ask you to bold it. <clears throat> Ooh. Allergies this morning. <laughs> All right, U plus V. So now we will need both of these vectors and we're supposed to be adding them. So let's take the U, which is five, I plus three J. So that's U. And then let's add the V, which is the nine I minus two J. Last one. Combine your like terms. Okay, combine <clears throat> an I with a J, but you can combine an I with an I. Five plus nine is 14, so that's a 14 I. And then 3j minus 2j would be a plus 1j, but you don't really need to write the 1. So that's 14i plus j. All right, last up, 4u minus 3v. So this is kind of like a combination of a through c, because we've got to do the distribution to the u and the v first, then we'll combine the like terms like we did in the last problem. So this will be four times the u, which is five i plus three j, then minus three, I'll do a different color just for emphasis, minus three times the v, I may have said j there for a second, minus three times the v vector, which is nine i minus two j. like so. <clears throat> Let's distribute the 4 and the negative 3 appropriately. So that'll give us 20i plus 12, oops, j. And then let's distribute the negative 3. So that's a negative 27i plus 6j. And then we can combine our like terms, ultimately giving us 20i minus 27i is negative 7i. The 12j plus 6j is a plus 18j. Again, if you prefer bold, that's negative 7i plus 18. See, if I'm typing, I use the bold. If I'm handwriting, the arrows are just a lot easier to use. All right. So there's no real complicated math there. We can add vectors, we can subtract vectors, we can multiply them by scalars, we can do combinations of scalar multiples of multiple vectors. But what we have not done here is multiplied a vector with a vector. Now we'll do one of those two versions, and you probably didn't know there were two versions, but this is me telling you that there's actually two ways to multiply vectors, and we'll do that in the next section. But spoilers, it's called a dot product and a cross product, and we're only going to do the dot product in this course. But the cross product is important when you get into three-dimensional algebra, trigonometry, and calculus. But we'll save that for another, another month, another year probably. All right, so how about... How about this though, before we get to that stuff. Unit vectors in any direction. Unit vectors in any direction. So we talked about what a unit vector was and we gave two specific unit vectors that we were just using in that last example, i and j. We said that a unit vector has a length of one. So as a reminder, oh, no more, underline. A unit vector has length one. And it had a notation that it, well, I'm sorry, we haven't done a notation yet. <laughs> we gave you the I and the J, but we didn't give you there uh, the notation if they were pointing in any other direction. So all we've said so far is that a unit vector has a length of one. And remember, 
that the length symbol in vectors is a double absolute value. So also, if I had this, uh, I didn't want to underline that. There we go. So again, that's just a reminder of what the notation for length is, for magnitude. It looks like an absolute value, but it has two bars around it. And you know why that is? Because an absolute value is a length, but it's only in one dimension. Absolute values are only on the number line. They only go left and right. Now our vectors can go left, right, up, and down. So for two dimensions, I guess they decided to slap on an extra pair of uh, absolute values. But no, a three-dimensional vector, its length does not have three of these around it. It's still just two. <laughs> I know that might have uh, been an idea in somebody's head, so I want to make sure we clarify that. All right, so what do we do if we want to find a unit vector in any direction? I was a unit vector in the positive horizontal direction. J was a unit vector in a positive vertical direction. But our world does not always revolve around going left, right, up, and down. We have all sorts of different um, coordinate systems. We have a rotational coordinate system. We have polar coordinates. Uh, when we're in three dimensions, we have even more options than just these. So what is very often helpful is to have a vector in a direction that's important to you. Maybe 10 degrees is an extremely important direction for you. Maybe it's something that in, in your job, you're just constantly uh, coming across. So you want a unit vector pointing 10 degrees up from the positive x-axis instead of it being the x-axis, because that would just make the rest of your math or symbolism way easier. All right, so given a vector, v let's go with v just to change things up it doesn't matter u v a doesn't matter what this letter is you can make a unit vector in the same direction by dividing it by its length And that symbol, you take the V, and now that looks bold <clears throat> because I can't do anything else uh, with my pen on this screen, uh, but instead of having an arrow above it, it has an upside down V, so even more symbols. So this is the symbol for a unit vector, and it's equivalent to, you take the original vector, and because all these are going to look bolded, I'm going to write the arrow above it. So you take the original vector and you divide it by its magnitude. This is a formula that you have to memorize. <clears throat> a unit vector is found by taking the original vector and dividing by its length. Just by dividing by the length, that's automatically going to make the length of this thing one. Because if the length of the vector is, say, 17, if you divide it by 17, that's going to make the new length one. If the length was originally 3.5, dividing by the length of 3.5 is going to make the new vector a length of one. And if you don't trust this, what you can do is once you get the components, find the magnitude of the components, and it should come up to one. So again, this formula is very very, very important. When you go on to three-dimensional calculus, I cannot describe to you how many times you're going to use this. So let's try using it. Example, what are we up to? Four. Isn't it crazy how different the pen is on Word versus <laughs> just using um, Zoom? All right, so we're just going to do one of these. If the vector u is equal to 3i minus 4j, find a unit vector in the same direction. So 
So 3i minus 4j is our original vector. And maybe this direction is just seen five quintillion times in our work. So we want a unit vector in that direction. So we have a basis in that direction. The unit vectors give us a basis. It gives us an easy way to go 10 in that direction instead of you know just always three and then a minus four. So the first thing we need to do is find the magnitude. We need to find out how long exactly is this vector. And this is where we do, it's just the Pythagorean theorem, the a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but we go ahead and take the square root of both sides. So that's the square root of the squares of the components. So the square root of three squared plus negative four squared. Well, three squared is nine, negative four squared is 16, nine plus 16 is 25. And this just happens to be a whole number. It's not very often that this is a whole number but the length of that vector is five because it's a standard three, four, five triangle. Yeah, it's not actually a triangle, but if you, if you wrote the, if you drew the vector and then um, put its components up there, you would see that it would form a standard triangle of three, four, five. So now the unit vector, oops, wrong symbol. The unit vector for this, again, it has a little upside down V. It's a hat, <laughs> and actually in math, we do call that U hat. It's kind of funny in my opinion. This is, we take the original vector and we divide it by its length. Again, we're just plugging numbers into formulas. We're not being super creative. We're not doing 10 million things. It's just a plug and chug problem. So the top is the vector U, which is three I minus four J, and the bottom, is the length of that vector, which we just came up with, it's five. That's it, that's the answer. <laughs> now it's nice if we split these up, of course, as three over five i minus four over five j, but technically before doing that, it was still accurate. There's no reductions, there's no combining, nothing happens. That is a unit vector in the same direction as the original vector. So. I'm going to draw up the vector in standard form, the original vector u. So 3i minus 4j. So that means we're going, if we start at the origin, we're going right, 1, 2, 3, and down, 1, 2, 3, 4. So here's our terminal point. The starting point is the origin. So there is our original vector u. So this was 3, this was negative 4. So that's 3i minus four J. In red, I'm going to draw the unit vector three fifths I minus four fifths J. So that means we're going right three fifths of a number. So if I slice this up five ways, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. And then we're gonna go down four fifths, one, two, three, four, five. So we're going right three down four. The terminal point should be right there. And that, in the red right there, <laughs> that would be u hat. That's the unit vector, 3 fifths i minus 4 fifths j. It just takes the 3 and the 4, and it divides them by a factor of the length. So that length is 1. And if you don't trust me, let's show the length. Let's show the magnitude of u hat. That would be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So 3 fifths squared plus negative 4 fifths squared. Just square tops and bottoms independently. So that's the square root of 9 over 25 plus 16 over 25, which is the square root of common denominator at the tops. 9 and 16 is 25. And guess what? 25 divided by 25 is 1. And the square root of 1 is 1. It works. So what happens is, by dividing by the length, that makes sure if you go back and sum the squares, the tops will add up to the same as the bottom, which makes them cancel, and that gives us our length of one. So again, if we saw 10 bajillion vectors pointing in this direction, it might be beneficial for us to just recalibrate uh, what we call left and right and what we call up and down. We can rotate our axes. Now, do we have to do that? No. 
and also they don't have to be orthogonal. You can have a coordinate system. So maybe this is one of your axes. So you can call that U, that's one axis, axis. And then maybe your other one is V. So these are your ax, your new axes in this weird coordinate system that just ha you happen to have a lot of vectors pointing in those directions. So you don't have to go orthogonal to each other. As long as these aren't parallel to each other, you can actually have two axes pointing in any direction. And man, let me tell you, the math gets super weird, but also extremely rewarding and fun after you start doing this stuff. Now, this isn't a focus for our class. This is way down the line. All right, actually, let me leave that for a second. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back to the word. So let's say we're given the length of a vector v. Uh, there we go. <laughs> and the angle theta. Just gonna... There we go. And the angle theta. The standard form of the vector can be written our vector v bolded or with an arrow over it, is the magnitude of the vector times the cosine of the angle times the i unit vector plus the magnitude of the vector times the sine of the angle times j. Again, this is a formula you should be memorizing. All this is, is the components for A and B. So previously we would say that a vector was A, I, plus B, J. So what we're doing is we're saying that A is this thing. I'm gonna erase this in a second. We're saying that A is that. And B is this. So, so far, we've given you components for the vectors, or at least starting in terminal points for you to be, to be able to find those. But what if we don't give you the components? What if, what if we don't give you the horizontal and vertical components? What if we tell you the length of the vector itself and the angle it forms from the positive x axis? Or anywhere, because you can always transform it. <laughs> Well, you can then find the components of the vector by doing the length times the cosine, that'll give you the x component, and the length times the sine, that'll give you the y component. So let me undo the little circling stuff, and let me explain why this is. So let's just say, here's our vector, and it has a length. And we know its angle, formed from the positive x-axis. In fact, let me, yeah, I'll do it in black. So there's the vector. Here's our x and y-axis. And here is the angle the vector forms from the positive x-axis. It does not have to be in quadrant one. It can be in quadrant two, three, or four. Doesn't matter. If you break this down into components, if you make a little right triangle out of it, This has to be the A and this has to be the B because the horizontal components what gets put in front of the I, the vertical components what gets put in front of the J. And you can figure out these links by trigonometry we did on day one or two together. You can just use your cosine and sine functions. So the sine, actually let's do cosine first. Let's, let's attack the A. Let's go after the A. So the cosine, doesn't matter which one you do first technically. So the cosine of that angle would be it's adjacent over its hypotenuse. So that's A over the magnitude of the vector, the length of the vector. If you just multiply both sides by the denominator, 
so that those cancel, that tells you exactly what you see up there. The magnitude or the length times the cosine is the A component. Boom. It's almost identical work to get the Y component to get this. Instead, we need to use the sine. Uh, red. So the sine of theta would be its opposite B over its hypotenuse, which is the length. Multiply both sides by that denominator again. So that they cancel. And that tells us that the length of the vector times the sine of its angle is equal to B. And there it is. So it doesn't matter what information we're given. We can always find the other scenario. If we're given the components, we can find the length and we can also find the angle. Uh, <laughs> we'll do that very shortly. Or if we're given the length and the angle, we can find the components. Both are important aspects. We have to be able to do it either way. But again, this is our formula. The X component gets cosine, the Y component gets sine. This is not the first time we've seen that theme. Very often, X components are related to cosines, Y components are related to sines. When we talked about the unit circle, the cosine was literally the X coordinate. The sine was literally the Y coordinate, and that's when we were dealing with things of length one. Fascinating that all this comes together. All right, so let's try this out. Example five, and we'll do two of these. Let's go back to black. All right, A. If the length of our vector is six and the angle this vector forms is 60 degrees, let's find the vector in standard form. That's just the abbreviation for standard. Okay, <clears throat> well, all you need is the formula from before. So that vector is gonna be the length times the cosine of the angle, and then I, that looks like a two, and then plus the length times the sine of the angle, times the J vector. Well, the length is sixth, the angle is 60 degrees. So that's six times the cosine of 60 degrees times the unit vector I, plus six times the sine of 60 degrees times the unit vector J. Now, if these are literally any other angle in the world, pretty much, you're gonna have to punch these in a calculator because we are generally interested in the decimal approximations, usually to one decimal point, but pay attention to what my math lab asks for. It might want a whole, it might want two decimals. I like one, generally speaking. But we know the cosine and sine of 60 degrees based on our old friend, the one, two, square to three triangle. The cosine of 60 is a half. The sine of 60 would be square root of three over two. So this is six times a half times the unit vector i plus six times the sine of 60 we said is square root of three over two times the unit vector j. But this is reducible. Six times a half is three. So that's three i plus six divided by two is three again, so three square root of three j. All right. Let's say our length was 11 
and the angle is 192 degrees. And let's be specific, find V in standard form to one decimal place. So again, we have our length and we have our angle. So we're just gonna use the formula that we have memorized. And if you don't memorize it, you can derive it in the same way I did in that word file. Draw up the length of the vector, uh, show the angle, make a right triangle out of it, understand the components, take the cosine and sine of them, multiply out the denominator. Proofs or memorization, you gotta understand one or the other. <laughs> so our vector in standard form is going to be the length 11 times the cosine of 192 degrees times the unit vector i plus the length times the sine of the angle, sine of 192 degrees, times the unit vector j. Um, why won't it let me, <laughs> hold on for a second. Uh, pause share. It will not let me do something. All right, there we go. All right, so for the X component, the 11 times the cosine of 192 degrees, let's check our mode. And I gotta make sure I'm in degree every time this thing resets, so I can quit. So 11 times the cosine of 192, close it, enter. We get negative 10.75, blah, blah, blah. So that's negative 10.8. So that is the number that will go in front of the I. I'm going to go ahead and, and do the other calculation here, though, which was 11 times the sine of the same angle. 11 times the sine. 192. Close it. And the Y component is negative 2.28 or negative 2.3 rounded to one decimal place. So our vector. That was negative 10.8i minus 2.3j. There we go. Okay. So nothing complicated here, just memorizing a form or understanding a form along with being able to handle some basic calculations, but this is definitely not inverse trig functions, uh, no, no graphing of sines and cosines or God forbid secants, cosecants could be way worse. All right, uh, da, 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 back to this. Next up, let's say we were given the components and we wanted to find the direction. So I'm just gonna write this out this time. Given the vector in component form, in standard form, AI plus BJ. That's not another J, that's a semicolon. To find the direction Well, so again, same thing. Here's our vector V, here's its length. And then the A and the B components are the horizontal and vertical bits. The angle formed is right here, but I don't necessarily, I'm drawing this as a right triangle and I don't necessarily know that it's a right triangle. So I'm gonna use that as a reference angle because it could be in quadrant two, three, or four. So if we did the tangent of that, 
We did sine and cosine earlier to get components. Maybe we need to do the tangent. <laughs> the tangent would be B over A. But if you wanted to find the angle, you can just take the inverse tangent of both sides. So the inverse tangent and tangent cancel as long as we are in the appropriate domain, as long as we are within the appropriate angles, which are quadrant one and four for tangent. So that tells us that the angle is the inverse tangent of B over A. Now notice that says reference angle. You need to watch this. You need to watch your quadrants. Pay attention. To where the vector V is. This formula, this inverse tangent of B over A only works if you're in quadrants one or four because inverse tangents only defined in one and four. So if your vector is pointing in, in quadrant three, you are not going to be able to get that angle accurately with this formula. You're going to have to adjust it. <clears throat> and don't worry, we will see that happen. So I'll show you what I mean by you'll have to pay attention and you'll have to adjust it if it's in the wrong spot. And then as a reminder, come on, let me scroll down. Oops, don't want that. What's happening? Okay, I'm not going to mess with that. <laughs> uh, let me just put it up here. Always something, right? And again, as a reminder, the length of the vector is always the square root of a squared plus b squared. <clears throat> That's nothing new. That's something we've seen several times now. What's new was this that you can find the angle as the inverse tangent of the ratio of the components, the X component over the Y component, but you have to be careful because this might make you think you're in a quadrant you're not actually in. So let's try that out. Example six, come on. Now my windows bar is stuck. I think it's because of this, there we go. All right, example six. Let's say given the vector V is negative four I plus five J. Let's find the length. And the angle at points. So if I give you the length and the angle, you can find the components. If I give you the components, you can find the length and the angle. Again, if I give you two bits of information, you can find the other, the others. <laughs> well, the length we were doing before, so let's go ahead and knock that out. The length of the vector, so this is just Pythagorean, square root of the sum of the squares. That's negative four squared plus five squared, which is the square root of 16 plus 25 which is the square root of 41. And that is not able to be broken down. So that's our length. <clears throat> then the angle, well, first of all, let's draw this thing ahead of time. The negative four I plus five J. So that means we're going left four and up five. One, two, three, four, five. So there's our vector V. This is in quadrant two, which is a problem. Inverse tangent <clears throat> will not pick up quadrant two. So we're going to have to adjust whatever answer we get. The answer we're about to get is going to be wrong if we call it the actual angle. We have to use reference angle. 
is again, this right here is the angle. We're finding this right here, <clears throat> the, in, the uh, excuse me, the reference angle. So that's supposed to be the inverse tangent of the B over the A. B is five, the A is the negative four. So then we pull up our TI-83. Turn it on, check our mode, we're good. Inverse tangent, so second tangent, and that was five over negative four. Five divided by negative four. Close it. And it tells us that the angle is negative 51.3 blah, 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 blah degrees. I said round to the nearest tenth, so this will be negative 51.3. So this says the angle is negative 51.3 degrees. That is not in quadrant two, that's in quadrant four. So we have to adjust this. Well, first of all, reference angles, we usually don't count as being negative. So you can just say the reference angle is 51.3, but that's how we're going to put this here. So if this is 51.3 degrees, that means that the other angle has to be 180 minus it. The actual angle would be 180 minus 51.3 degrees, which when you do that subtraction, you get 128.7 degrees. That's our angle. <clears throat> this is the number one mistake made on test questions when they're asked to find an angle. I love to give angles that are not going to be in quadrant one or four because it means you have to think. You have to actually understand this stuff, not just blindly follow. Now, if you don't trust this, if you don't trust this, maybe you thought that the actual angle was either 51 or negative 51. You could try. saying that the vector, the components, are the length times the cosine times i uh, plus the length times the sine times j. So let me just do one of these. Let's do, let's do the y component. So the magnitude times the sine of the angle. So the magnitude was square root of 41. Close it, then times the sine of the angle. And we came up with approximately 128.7. And we get an, a y component of five. Let's see what would have happened if I didn't use the 128.7 though. So let's do square root of 41 times the sine of and whether it's positive or negative, let's, let's try the, ne the negative one is what you would have found. So the negative uh, 51.3. And look, it comes up as negative five. So you can see that that component would be wrong. Now, if you did it as positive, it would actually end up being correct, but the X component would be incorrect. It's always a positive or negative issue when you're using an angle from the wrong quadrant. Because remember, these angles all pretty much represent the same thing except positive or negative components in different directions. Oh, excuse me, that was a stretch. <laughs> so we've picked up several different important formulas in this section. The unit vector, again, very important moving forward in later math classes. You just take a vector and you divide it by its length. We learned how to have the components and get the, the length and angle, or given the length and angle, find the components. 
the angle being the weirdest one. Again, this is where more people make mistakes. I see lots of people knock out everything else beautifully, but then they kind of crumble when it comes to doing this. So again, just please, please, please make sure that you're practicing this stuff. Remember the homework is not necessarily enough and I'm not supposed to expand the homework problems. You might need to do the problems more than once. Go to the textbook and find similar problems. Go to the internet and find similar problems. There's nothing super crazy here, but it's enough to keep you busy. All right, I'm gonna make a new page because it was being so wacky. And let's move on to 7.7, .7, the dot product. <clears throat> so we focused on adding and subtracting vectors. We focused on multiplying them by scalars, but I mentioned in passing that we didn't do multiplying a vector and a vector in the last section. And once again, there are two different ways to multiply two vectors. You have the dot product and you have the cross product. The dot product, we call it a dot product because <laughs> we use that symbol for the multiplication. We use the dot symbol. So u dot v, u times v. Well, this is just a formula. We're not gonna do any rationalization for this, but this is going to be the product of the x components plus the product of the y components. So this is a1 times a2 plus b1 times b2. And that's if we're denoting the vector u as a i, a, sorry, a sub one i plus b sub one j and the vector v is just gonna have little twos. a sub two i plus b sub two j. So this is the dot product, this is the definition. This is one of the two ways to multiply vectors. This is a formula that you have to, surprise, surprise, memorize. Is it a crazy formula? No. Is it a simple concept that I'd say, I don't even remember the formula personally? Yes. You multiply the X components, you multiply the Y components, and you add them. It kind of feels like Pythagorean. It's like this is the A squared and this is the B squared, except they're two different A's and B's. That's kind of what it feels like. There's a reason for that. It's, they're closely related. <laughs> but this is when the, the vectors are not necessarily orthogonal. And again, you have two different vectors. So it's not just one, it's two. The cross product, I'm not gonna show you the actual formula for what it is. Again, this is not in our class. But the symbol for it, instead of the dot, oops. You put an X between them. This is the symbol for cross product. And there again, there's a formula. It involves matrices, kind of. <laughs> and it's also very, very important. Um, one of the, the first kind of physics properties you learn with a cross product is it relates to torque. So like when you use a screwdriver, the force uh, that you uh, get out of it from twisting it, that's a cross product. So again, not a big crazy formula, nothing too crazy to, to try out. Let's try it out. Oh shit, that's the whiteboard. So now we're in seven, seven. Example one. And let's do two of these. Find u dot v for a. Let's have u. be uh, 2i minus 3j. And then let's have v be 5i 
plus two. Uh, no, I don't want to use the same number. Let's go plus seven J. And again, with my I's and J's, if I ever don't put the little vectors over them, just assume that I meant to bold them. <laughs> All right, so u dot v. And this would be the same as if they were bolded, bold u dot bold v. We just take the x components and multiply them, which are the two and the five, so that's two times five. Then we add the product of the y components, negative three and seven. Two times five is 10. Negative three times seven is minus 21. 10 minus 21 is negative 11, and that's it. Let's have u be the same, 2i minus 3j. And v, let's have this be negative 5i minus 7j. I might do a third one, actually. So u dot v. Multiplying the x components, that's 2 times negative 5 plus multiply the y components. That's negative three times negative seven. Two times negative five is negative 10. Negative three times negative seven is a positive 21. And negative 10 plus 21 is positive 11. Huh, interesting. When I just change the signs of one vector, it ends up changing the sign of their product. I think that makes sense in basic terms of math because Let's say if you have five times seven, if you change the sign of one of them, it changes the sign of the answer. So that's kind of cool. So I bet you can imagine that if I change the signs of the U's but not the V's, that the answer would just, again, change signs. But let's not do that for C. Let's have the U vector be, once again, 2i minus 3j. And the V vector be, let's go with 3i plus 2j. And I've picked these numbers very specifically. So u dot v. Multiply the x components, that's 2 times 3. Plus, multiply the y components, that's negative 3 times 2, which is 6 minus 6, and that's 0. Huh. You can multiply some vectors and get zero? What? You know what? I'm kind of interested in that. Let's draw up C. So in red, I'll do U, which is 2i minus 3j. Oops, I need some axes numbers. Let's go three in each direction. One, two, three, one two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So U is two I minus three J, that's right two down three. So this is our U vector. V, three I plus two J, that's gonna go right three and up two, and I'll do that in blue. Right three and up two. So that's our v vector. Guess what? Look at, look at this. If you tilt your head to the right quite a bit, it should look, if I was an amazing artist, it should look like that's a right angle. And guess what it is? That is a right angle. If you did enough of these, you would see this so often that you'd go, that's got to be a right angle. And what that does is it leads us to a theorem. Now, if I did A or B, this would not happen. <laughs> 2i minus 3j, that's right 2 down 3. That's the same u. V is right 5 up 7. That would not form a 90 degree angle. The next one would not form a 90 degree angle. This is a very special case. So problem C 
led to these being a right angle and its dot product was zero. That's not a coincidence. They are extremely tied together. So let's write that out. Hopefully you can take that leap of faith. But if u dot v, if the dot product is equal to zero, then the two vectors are what is known as orthogonal. Orthogonal. And that means there's a 90 degree angle between them. There's a right angle between them. Two vectors are orthogonal or have a right angle between them if their dot product is zero. Now what's awesome is this is true even in three dimensions. Now remember previously in the last section I was going off on this ra uh, ram rammer ramble <laughs> rant. I was rambling on about a rant uh, where you don't have to have your axes pointing left, right, up, and down. You can point them 10 degrees up and 80 degrees up, and you can form a coordinate system out of that. You can have literally millions of different types of coordinate systems. You can make one that's the most convenient for you if your world is tilted like a politician. Ha, ha, ha. I should have said crooked. Oh, it was a terrible, terrible fail of the joke. Anyways, <laughs> it works. It works. It's good enough. So it's not really that great to have a, d a dimensional system where your axes aren't orthogonal. It's fine, but it's in our best interest most of the time to form an orthogonal basis. That way there's no overlapping. That way you can't have two coordinates to represent the same point. When you have an orthogonal coordinate system, every point is unique. If they're not orthogonal, yes, you can describe every point, but you could actually describe some points in multiple ways, which just sounds weird. How can you describe a single point with several different values, but you can. So having an orthogonal basis, so having unit vectors that are orthogonal to each other is very, very critical when you want a good coordinate system that aren't necessarily pointing left, right, up, and down. So two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is zero, which means going back to that example, C was orthogonal. So U and V in C are orthogonal. So I could ask you a question, <clears throat> are these two vectors orthogonal? I could just go back to example one and rewrite the instructions. Instead of saying find the dot product, I could just say, are these vectors orthogonal? Which would still make you do the dot product on every single one. A is not zero, so that's not orthogonal. B is not zero, so that's not orthogonal, but C is. So I just did two problems for the price of one. How are we on time? 904? Yeah, we got enough time. Okay, last topic for the day, I promise. So an alternate form for the dot, dot product. Let's say instead of given the components, you were given the magnitude and the angle between them. So if given the links of the vectors instead, plus the angle between them, The dot product is, now I wanna label what I'm talking about. So the length of the vectors, that would be the length U and the length V, plus the angle between them, we'd call that theta. So here's your vector U, and then here is your vector V. And then this is the angle between them. 
So I'm not trying to say that the angle between them is 90 degrees with that picture. It could be anything. It could be anything from zero to 180 degrees. But it can't be more than three, excuse me, more than 180 degrees. Because if you take those and just form them completely away from each other, that would be 180 degrees. If you then start bending in the opposite direction, you're just going to take the smaller of the two angles because you could always say, all right, well, this is less than 180 and then this one would be more than 180. So this would be an alternate version of the angle going the opposite way. But we don't want to use the bigger one because spoilers, we're going to end up using an inverse cosine function and that's only good from zero to 180. In other words, there's not going to be any issues. But if you did some massaging of the formulas, again, the interest of time, we got to skip some stuff the dot product of v and uh, v and u, excuse me, u and v. Why am I doing v first? Not that it matters. The order of a dot product does not matter, but the order of a cross product does. <laughs> it's the only time an order matters with multiplication. This is the product of the magnitudes. I know that gets... A little silly looking with all those vertical lines, but that's the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle between them. And if you algebraically rearrange this, why does it want to do that like to me now? I don't get it. Okay, either way. So this is an alternate form to the dot product. And you can actually get that formula by forming some right, tri uh, some right triangles out of this because this is the length U, this is the length V. I'll leave that up to your imagination. Maybe it's an extra little uh, project for you. Dig it up online, how that formula is derived. But what this is actually more important for us is the fact that there's an angle in this because if we rearrange to solve for theta. So in other words, if we know the components and the lengths of a vector, we can find the angle if you divide both sides by the length and then take an inverse cosine. Again, you'll divide by the length, so you'll get the dot product over the lengths and then do an inverse cosine of both sides. You'll get the angle is equal to the inverse cosine of the dot product over the lengths. It looks like a terrifying formula. It's a very basic idea. It's the inverse cosine of the dot product over the links. The inverse cosine of the dot product over the links. All right, so let's try that out and we'll call it a day. What were we up to? Example two, three, two. Uh, given that you is equal to, let's go negative 2i. I like that negative 2i plus 3j. I like those numbers together. And the vector v is equal to 4i plus 6j. Let's just find the angle between them. That's a very different angle. We're not finding U's angle. We're not finding V's angle. We're finding the angle between them. 
Well, based on the formula, we need to know the magnitudes first. So the first thing we got to do is find the length of u, which is the square root of negative two squared plus three squared, which is the square root of four plus nine, which is the square root of 13. We also need the length of v, which is the square root of four squared plus six squared. And that's square root of 16 plus 36. Uh, it's 4252. Can that be broken up? Yes, it can. So that's the square root of four times 13, which is two square root of 13. So those are the lengths. We got the square root of 13 and we got a two square root of 13. So the angle, and you can just use the original formula and do the algebraic manipulation, or you can memorize it. It was what? The inverse cosine, the inverse cosine of the dot product over the magnitudes. So the dot product of u dot v over the magnitudes. <laughs> So that's the inverse cosine of, well, we know the magnitudes, that's the square root of 13 times two square root of 13. The dot product would be negative two times four plus three times six. If you needed to do that to the side first, you could. Negative two times four is negative eight, three times six is 18. And that's, If I said 16, I meant to say 18. I think I said 18. I'm just having a bunch of scribbles. So theta is equal to the inverse cosine, because we're short on time, of 10 over square root of 13 times square root of 13. There's still the two. That's the square root of 169, which is the inverse cosine of 10 over 2 times 13, which is the inverse cosine of 10 over 26 which is the inverse cosine. You don't have to technically do all this simplification of five over 13. We go to our calculator, five thirteenths, five thirteenths. Second cosine five divided by 13. And you get 67.4 when you round to the nearest tenth. 67.4 degrees. So definitely not orthogonal. And you could have told that with just doing the dot product. In this course, we don't have as much of a use of this at this point um, for various reasons, but this is an excellent, excellent application for physics. So you would get to use that a lot in a physics and engineering course or in even just later math courses. Uh, but we will call it a day there. We have finished 7.7. .7, so we have finished everything we're going to do for chapter seven. So get to work on that homework uh, as soon as possible if you have not already. Uh, we'll get into chapter 11 next class and hopefully I'll have an idea about the test. But besides that, have a good day. Have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday.